Okay, I, I told Mike, I'm just going to throw this up for just a second. Um, rightly so, last week uh, w when I was uh, kind of whining about having a hard time sometimes when you had the, the same names of the King of the North and the King of the South, rightly so, Erica said, well, Skip, here you can look at the, the uh, uh, timeline and you can see that the King of the North right after Ahab, Joram, J-O-R-A-M, uh, and in, in the South, the king's name was J-E-H-O-R-A-M. Absolutely right, 100% correct. However, as I go through hundreds of scriptures each week and, and, and commentaries and all this kind of stuff, which I love, I'm not complaining, um, I see a lot more than than I, I show you all, uh, just because you know there's so much stuff I can't I can't show. But I want to show you why last week I said that I get confused. Now I'm not the brightest candle in the box. I'm telling you that right now. I can read, uh, I can put together some, some some stuff. But anyway, there was a question last week as to why I called the two kings of Israel and Judah both Joram and Jehoram interchangeable. Uh, and you'll note in the timeline, as I said, it, it shows that the king of the north was Joram and the king of the north, south were Jehoram. Well, I want to show you a few scriptures as to why I get confused. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, I, 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 like I say, I don't, I don't show all of these to you. But in 2 Kings uh, 117, uh, and the context is not all that important, but he died according to the word of Yahweh, which Elijah had spoken. And it says, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're telling me that, that there's a Jehoram in the north and a Jehoram in the south. So, you know, and then in 2 Kings 9, 22, and hopefully you'll see why. Have, have, you know, I've gotten confused about all of this. It says it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu. Now, Joram here in this case is the king of the north. When he saw Jehu, he said, is it peace, Jehu? And we're, we're actually going to get into this chapter today. And he answered, you know, how can we have peace as long as your crazy mother is is still alive? And it says, Joram turned his hands and fled and, and said, there's treachery. And then it says, Jehu drew a bow and, and smote Jor Jehoram. Well, they, they just said his name was Joram. Now they're saying his name is Jehoram in just in three verses. And then in 2 Kings 9, 29, in the 11th year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. So now we have a Joram in the south, the king of the south. And then in 2 Chronicles 22, 1, it says the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king for the band of men that came with the Arabians had slain all the elders. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah. Well, he just got through calling the king of Judah, Joram. And then in, in 2 Chronicles 22, 6, he returned to be healed in Jezreel because of the wounds that were given him at Ramah when he fought with Hazel, king of Syria, and Azariah, the, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, okay, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, at Jezreel because he was sick. You know, I can't help but laugh at this, but this is why I said last week that it's hard for me to keep up with who in the world, you know, I've got to look at the context and uh, I mean, we all need to look at the context, but that that's, that's why I said last week that I get confused about which King it is that we're, that we're talking about. So anyway, I just wanted to show you that because it's really kind of funny. I can't help but wonder, and I'm, I am being facetious here, but I can't help but wonder if the writers of Kings said, hey, let's have a little fun with these people. <laughs> so 
anyway, they are interchangeably called Joram and Jehoram uh, in the king of the north and the king of the south. So now we are going to turn over uh, the service to our, our, our friend, Michael Deering, and I, I hope you, you appreciate my picture of the, the, the red clouds and the, you know, overhanging and, you know, all of that. I, there was a little method to my, to my madness here. So, Michael, I'm going to, uh, where are you? You are there. I'm at the top. You want me to do it? Yeah, you can do it. Fine. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Let me know when it pops up. So I'm showing main screen. Okay, that took a little bit of time. Okay. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Hello, hello. And Skip, if you could uh, <clears throat> man the chat. Okay. Because I cannot see it at all. all right. um, wait, get out of here one quick second. Do a little, I got to uh, uh, decrease some of these uh, go to meeting boxes so I can actually see my screen. And uh, so I can at least see the attendees. So if their mic comes on, I can at least call on them to. Uh, give a chat. Okay. I, I cannot see any chats at all. So um, if you see a mic, come on, just, just, you be the, uh, help me moderate this, Skip. You'll do oh, a good job. I will. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks for the uh, stuff on the chart. And I had it in here. If you want to talk more about it in a second, I've asked Bach for you if other thoughts come up on that chart. But uh, well, since about the end of February, that's when I calculated how far back we've been, uh, we've been in this study on the non-writing profits. And Skip's been leading us in this uh, very in-depth study. And in so doing, we've, <clears throat> we've been led through the sordid history of ancient Israel after King Solomon. And, um, and what, we, what we've learned is that the, the history that we're, we're learning about is, is not a pretty one. And in many ways, uh, there are parallels to a lot of what we see taking place around us uh, in the United States, in the West, and in the world today in terms of national decline and lawlessness in society. Now, if my recollection is correct, from where we began, um, and you guys could correct me because I'm not 100% sure, we covered more than 200 years or so of time after King Solomon, which led to the civil split of Israel into two kingdoms, with 10 tribes in the north that became, you know, the northern tribe of Israel, and Judah in the south, which was made up of Judah, Benjamin, and of course the, the Levitical priesthood. And that was caused by exorbitant taxes and a king who decided to ignore <clears throat> good counsel and was outraged that the people would dare ask for the yoke of high taxes to be lessened. And so he creates a blueprint in a way of oppression that uh, it would seem uh, the King George III would emulate in his own fashion uh, nearly three millennia later. Um, just something to notice there that the, the, the Civil War was split over high taxes. Um, and so the split of Israel in two kingdoms led to a succession of kings in both the South and the North. And as Skip mentioned with the chart, the scripture gets very confusing as to the, the chronology and uh, would indicate the reign of one or uh, of the kings of Judah with the new king crown in Israel, uh, given that some kings of Israel, they lasted a year or two, they shared similar names. And you know, as, you know, and this, this is the chart again that Mark uh, Gully gave us, and we really appreciate it because this does help. Um, again, if you, this chart, the, the yellow is uh, the Northern tribes uh, and the kings that ruled the Northern 10 kingdoms. The green is the uh, 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 Judah, uh, and Benjamin in the south uh, with Jerusalem. And in the middle, the blue are the prophets. And the uh, the blue and the white are the non-writing prophets. We've been, been uh, reading about them in these studies uh, that we've been going on uh, with Skip for, you know, the last, I want to say about 20, 22 weeks. And so do um, you have anything else to say about this chart, Skip, uh, as far as Timeline or anything? Did you get it all out already? I, I, you know, I'm done. I just want to thank again, thank Mark, because I've had all kinds of timelines, but I, I never had found this particular one, which is so much easier to read. And, and thank you so much, Mark, for because this this baby's going to be popping up a whole lot going forward. Okay. Well, in these studies over the last 22 weeks, and that's my my rough calculation of how long we've been doing the the uh, non-writing profits. Now, Skip's been taking us through detailed history 
uh, mostly of the northern kingdoms collapse into debauchery through the uh, through, through these studies and uh and the prophets you know these are men of god um that were sent to warn his own people of the consequences that were going to befall them for their abandonment of yahweh elohim um and his laws in order to embrace pagan alien gods and the oops, i guess i went too far my apologies there um uh, the alien gods of the nations that surrounded israel that were welcomed back into the land after Joshua, the Joshua generation ran them out of the land, but because of their sin, Israel invited them right back in uh, during subsequent generations after King David. And they did this despite God's clear warning against doing so. And he pleaded with his people to forsake the direction they were going and return to him. Now, sadly, despite miracles and other things that prophets like Elijah and Elisha performed, as a testimony, evil and wickedness in Israel kept getting worse with each successive king and ruler. And we know it ultimately led to the northern 10 tribes being utterly destroyed from the face of the earth, just as the covenant said that they would be. Israel's remnant, the northern kingdom of 10 tribes were invaded, slaughtered, and taken into an Assyrian captivity that was so complete that the minuscule remnant that were left alive and their, of their posterity lost all knowledge of who they were, what their ancestry was. And so they essentially disappeared from history. And that fate we understand is because Yehovah was fulfilling the covenant that Israel agreed to follow, whereby the blessings and cursings that are listed, for example, in Deuteronomy 28 were activated. Now, in one case, you may remember during the study on the Syrian siege of Samaria, um, and, and Skip kind of, I think, gleefully uh, delighted in, in uh, being uh, graphic as far as what the people were eating. They were paying fortunes so they could eat a rotting donkey head. And they were cooking and eating their own children. And Mark reminded us that this, too, was actually part of the covenant. And we'll read that here in Deuteronomy. Again, Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and cursings chapter. The first 15 verses are the blessings that will come for obedience. And the rest of the chapter, or here comes the curses. And these are the this is the covenant agreement that Israel made. So uh, beginning in uh, verses uh, 53 and 54, it says, Then you will eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and distress that your enemy will inflict on you. The most gentle and refined man among you will be grudge his brother, the wife he embraces, and the rest of his children who have survived, refusing to share with them the flesh of his children, he will eat because he has nothing left in the siege and distress that your enemy will inflict on you within all your gates. And that's pretty sobering, but there it is. And the consequence of what Israel would suffer, uh, it was not an unknown or a mystery. They were spelled out in advance. As the people and kings grew more and more comfortable with wickedness, they forgot God and his laws and the consequences that were promised to come for the behavior and lifestyle they now embraced and preferred. I'm sure I got this correctly. I do have a little bit of a, a frog in my throat uh, when I woke up this morning. So <clears throat> if I'm uh, clearing it or uh, coughing, please do forgive me. Uh, again, I had a meeting last night that went a little long, but... Um, just uh, bear with me, please. I'm not a professional. Anyway, so the prophets were sent by God to remind and warn these people of the consequences that were going to come for continuing to go in the direction they were. Basically, they were sent to plead with God's people to show them that their false gods were nothing and to return to their one true God most high. And he was willing to forgive if all of them if they would just repent and return. Jehovah still gave them, even in the midst of their sins, ample opportunities to repent and have victory even over their enemies, despite the fact they, they had ongoing sins. You know, uh, during the, one of the battles that they had, uh, Ahab, God was still going to give them victory if they would, uh, you know, just repent. And the prophets were given power to perform miracles to testify that the God of their father Abraham was supreme over the Baals or the Baals 
that kings like Jeroboam caused Israel to serve and worship. So in these studies that Skips led us in, we were able to see that it all began, at least that's how I see it, with the slow incremental allowance of foreign ideas, foreign gods, and the subsequent influences that corroded their people and poisoned their purpose. And so the worship of other Elohim became common to the point that Israel could walk in sins proudly without any care or concern of the consequences because they had adopted a new morality, one that was totally opposite of the holiness of the God who saved their ancestors from Egypt. Um, as I go on here again, I've, I've, I've got my, my script written out, but uh, as we always are want to do and, and we're invited to do, if anyone has a comment or a question, uh, again, please just uh, zing it in there and, uh, and we'll be happy to uh, hear what you uh, have to say at any point. Uh, I'm good with being interrupted, so we're fine. Okay, so while most of our time has been spent um, in the Northern Kingdom, we get a glimpse. Michael? Yeah. I've got, got a comment I thought about when you were going through that about how they abandoned God and turned away to, uh, to the Gentile or to the nations, to, the, to those who didn't follow, follow God. But that doesn't. While this is this is uh, what I'm going to mention here doesn't specifically rate, relate to the tribe of Israel. It does relate to the to the fact that people can do some pretty terrible things, and um, you know we should be reminded that like in First Corinthians chapter five, you know, with the incident of the person in their congregation who decided that he would blatantly have a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Um, it actually is, this is a quote from that, from first Corinthians five, one is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not, that is not tolerated even among the pagans. So the the point being that you know the the it, it, when a person goes off the edge when a nation goes off the edge it can get absolutely terrible bad and it's not even necessarily as bad as the nations around it can be worse that's the observation Yes, thanks, and and we're we're seeing we're beginning to see that in these studies, um, and as we go along, I think we're gonna gonna experience that a little bit of ourselves. <clears throat> of course, we know from prophecy, things that are gonna happen upon the world uh, are gonna be so horrifying that they were unlike anything that's ever happened before. I think that just uh, uh, bolsters your point, Mark. So while our time with Skip <clears throat> in these studies have been spent in Northern Kingdom. We get a glimpse that the same kind of sins were also beginning to spread and permeate in Judah and Benjamin as well. And this is because my point is, like yeast, the Apostle Paul tells us, uh, sin, sin, sin spreads. It says your boast. This is First Corinthians five and uh, uh, verse six. It says your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You introduce a little yeast, or you leave it out where yeast is present, and it's going to start small and it's going to just going to end up spreading and infecting and eventually grow and encompass everything. And so a few weeks ago in these studies that Skip has been doing with us, we learned that even while King Jehoshaphat of Judah, Judah was considered a good king, uh, we know that he was kind of a kind of a compromiser. His, his son, for example, married Alathalia. And I don't know if I'm saying these uh, these names correctly. So if anyone knows the correct pronunciation, if you want to have it correct, you can uh, chime in, but uh, uh, Athalia or Alathalia, I'm not sure, Alathalia, the daughter of Jezebel. And Jezebel was the Phoenician wife to one of the most wicked kings in the Northern Kingdom, uh, who was King Ahab. And so the seed of leaven and wickedness that had a stranglehold on the Northern Kingdom of Israel was now also being firmly planted in the seed of Judah's throne. Now you could say that this seed was actually put there by King Solomon. And I'm not going to argue against that point uh, because it can be argued the entirety of Israel's downfall began there. 
And as you remember, King Solomon had many, many, many uh, Gentile wives of the nations that he married, and he allowed them to uh, worship their gods in Israel. And that's kind of the genesis for where a lot of this comes from. <clears throat> now, two weeks ago, Skip posted a verse from Second Chronicles as he was uh, covering the timeline of the reign of the kings of both Judah and Israel. So as to come to an understanding over the seeming confusion over the chronological, uh, chronological order in Second Kings. <clears throat> and Skip gave us this verse in Second Chronicles chapter 4, which covers the ascension of uh, Ahaziah, the grandson of King Jehoshaphat, after his father uh, Jehoram died. And that would be him, and we'll get to the scripture here. Okay, so this is Second Chronicles uh, chapter 22, verses 2 through 4 says uh, Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king of Judah. Um, and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Amri, King Amri, who was also evil and wicked. Ahaziah also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. For his mother was his counselor in wickedness, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done. For to his destruction, they were his counselors after the death of his father. And I was struck by the wording of that verse, and it triggered a recognition of something that we see today. Ahaziah, it says, was counseled by his mother and the wicked counselors of evil King Ahab. And you may recall that after Skip had read that verse, I made the comment, that this would be akin to a description of what we would call the deep state, that unseen and somewhat invisible oligarchy that calls the shots in society and government, wicked counselors who always have the ear of those who are put into office, kind of in another example of nothing new under the sun. The scripture tells us uh, something uh, about the nature of corruption and power and its influence on society and a nation. Again, recall the analogy of sin of leavening, and this is also true of political wickedness and corruption, and of course, evil in general. And so I kind of wanted to explore that idea. And this presentation is, is the result of that, uh, my cursor you look into, and you can kind of call it the deep state of evil. Now a disclaimer. A little, little Lord of the Rings there. Well, I, uh, yeah, the allegories, it, those of you that are Lord of the Rings fans who have seen, who read the books, seen the movies, I think the allegories are appropriate. Um, that's why they're there. Um, and so I'm going to make a disclaimer, and this is something that I've, I've learned that I'm, I'm comfortable with now, um, and I'm good at, at, at admitting faults and mistakes, but a disclaimer. Uh, in the process of drawing these parallels that, uh, that I'm going to share with you guys, I am going to be getting political. Uh, and I'm going to be doing so for the sake of illustrating the commonalities with ancient Israel uh, that are going on right now and to explain uh, what the terms that I'm using are and what they mean and why. <clears throat> okay, so everybody's okay on that. I hope so. So now when, we use the, when I use the term deep state uh, in our current state of national affairs, it generally, generally refers to the permanent apparatchiks in government. You know, presidents and elected officials come and go, but these deep state people remain. And these would be similar to the counselors that Second Chronicles 22 is describing. These are the real players with power, the people behind the scenes who establish agendas and policy. They're really not accountable to anyone who fund and by influence to those who do make public policy. Um, scripture states that um, Athalia um, was a counselor in wickedness, and that would fit with what I understand is the definition of the deep state. Acolytes to engineer government power and control over a population to secure their own power. Now, she was the king's counselor, I guess I would say, in the wokeness agenda of ancient Israel, um, of which we're, we've been studying of Ahab's house which was the specific worship of the Phoenician gods and their systems like Baal. And that's kind of their version of woke. I'm throwing the term wokeness on top of their religion, even though it's a modern term that's being put onto a, 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 a political or religious practice back then, just so that we could kind of understand where my mind's at on this. Um, 
So such counselors of the deep state wield authority and power, sometimes even greater than those who hold office, because they have the ability to influence or impose their own will on the political and even military leaders of a nation, counselors in wickedness to our own destruction. So I did a cursory look into what scripture has to say about counselors in wickedness. And I found some interesting passages that I think apply to the notion of a deep state. Now do note, this is how I, me personally, see these verses in the context of the subject of the deep state of evil. And you may see these verses in an entirely different way in application, and that's perfectly fine, folks. I make no claim of being a Bible teacher. Uh, Skip and his mentor, Ron Dart, hold that mantle. Uh, it's not one that I wear. Uh, I'm just doing, I guess, as I want to do. Uh, I like to look at scripture is how it applies in our current modern life and applying these verses in a prism of modern context uh, regarding the subject of evil, power, and politics. Now, I understand some folks also have an aversion to discussing politics or current events on the Sabbath, but time and circumstances happen to all men and reading the signs of the times is one of those things that's actually i believe is a benefit and not a hurt in my estimation kind of got this out of ecclesiastes uh chapter 9 and verse 12. It says moreover no one knows when their hour will come as fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them but because we're being watchful and we're being discerning, evil times do not have to fall upon us unexpectedly. And I will note that evil times are usually the byproduct of liars in the councils of leadership. Go to another guy, but several verses here uh, in Proverbs, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 5. The thoughts of the righteous are just, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. Lies are just the accepted course of doing business when it comes to politics. I mean, consider, we don't even flinch anymore when politicians are caught, caught in both face lies anymore. We just accept it as par for the course when anyone's running for office. The art of deceit is endemic to those who advise politicians and leaders in office. It's the nature of evil and wicked people to lie and cause others to lie in order to gather power for themselves. Proverbs 29 and verse 2 says, when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. But when the, when the wicked rule, the people groan. And that's self-explanatory, is it not? Uh, I mean, I groaned under eight years of Clinton. My wife can tell you that. Uh, even more so under eight years of Obama. Uh, and I groan now even louder under the dementia puppet being animated by the deep state. Of course, I groaned under Trump too, but not quite as much as I am right now. Uh, I don't know how much groaning you folks have done, but I've done a lot of groaning and complaining to the point my kids will roll their eyeballs. There goes dad again. Now, <clears throat> one more scripture here. Um, if a ruler listens to lies, it's Proverbs 29, 12. If a ruler listens to lies, all his officials will be wicked. Now, this is a key statement of truth uh, that those desperately hoping to retain trust in corrupted institutions willfully ignore. It's also a key component of the deep state. If a leader is listening to lies and buys into lies told to him, his entire staff and all their officials are going to be evil and wicked, and they too will push the lie. Now today, we call it establishing the narrative. And the narrative is simply everyone listening to the lies told to them, and then going out to make sure everyone else speaks the same lies without deviation deceiving and being deceived as second timothy chapter 3 and verse 13 tells us it's then that the counsels of wickedness will project onto their targets that which they themselves are or accuse them of doing what they themselves are doing and the righteous would see through this as yahweh sees through it and i have an example of that in ezekiel chapter 11 verses 2 through 8 it says and the lord said to me son of man these are the men who plot evil and give wicked counsel in this city. They are saying, is not the time near to build houses? The city is a cooking pot and we are the choice meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. 
And the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and told me to declare that this is what the Lord says. Quote, that this is what you are thinking, O house of Israel. And I know the thoughts that arise in your minds. You have multiplied those you killed in the city and filled its streets with the dead. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says. The slain you have laid within this city are the choice meat, and the city is the pot, but I will remove you from it. You fear the sword, so I will bring the sword against you, declares the Lord God. Now, several commentaries I read about this exact passage indicate that the men mentioned in verse one, the plotters of evil and wicked counsel, had declared those decrying their evil as the scraps of meat to be boiled in an uproar that they would instigate in the city, which caused their deaths. Kind of a false flag, an entrapment. Think January 6th in, in Ezekiel's time, only with lots of dead in the streets. Now the men that instigated all this considered themselves the choice meat. And God was stating that the choice meat actually were those that they killed and that the ones that instigated the trouble were the scraps. At least that, well, anyone have any thoughts on that? I heard of that you skip. Yeah, I moved a piece of paper, sorry. Okay, so the deep state always brings about the death and suffering, usually of their own people, uh, the people they're supposed to serve. And they always seem to have an incestuous relationship with those in power. Now, in correlating the scriptural accounts of counselors of wickedness with what I see as the U.S. deep state, I guess consider this. Most of the people who ended up in counselor and cabinet positions in, uh, for example, the Obama administration were holdovers from Bill Clinton's administration. Many of those were also placed in the lobbying and other stations during George W. Bush's term. Now, Trump had holdovers in his cabinet of both Obama and Bush, and they basically sabotaged his presidency. And right now, the ones actually running the Biden presidency are Obama, Susan Rice, Samantha Power, the World Economic Forum, and Soros Acolytes that have been in Washington, D.C. for decades. And they basically populate the whole of federal government, from the Pentagon to the Department of Justice and all the other alphabet agencies in uh, D.C. And not just in the United States either. Many acolytes and members of the World Economic Forum are now leaders in most Western nations, like Trudeau of Canada, for example. And so if scripture were depicting what is happening with America today, uh, this, if there was a scripture about what's happening today, it, it might look like something like this. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord, as the administration of Obama had done, for to our destruction, they were Biden's counselors after the feat of Donald Trump in 2020. Just again, just uh, my own imagination there. It's not scripture, but if it were, it might read like that. Now, in that cabal are the lobbyists, political action committees, or PACs, which have huge sums of money to buy policy and legislation. And in fact, if you do a, a, a little bit of digging, you're going to discover that Congress no longer writes the legislation. Uh, instead, it's written by these lobbying groups and uh, political action committees tens of thousands of pages in bills that not a single legislator reads before voting them into law because they're paid and paid well. Now, up until the last few decades, what could be called the American deep state was content to enrich and empower themselves uh, and only themselves. But right around the time of Bill Clinton in 1992, the focus began to shift, at least in my observation, to more openly embrace the nations and diminish America so as to become one with the world. Now, from then, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about abandoned the idea of an American led empire with themselves at the helm. Strategically placed leaders in every key position saw themselves as fulcrums of change. They allied themselves and their stewardships with giant global corporations, hedge fund groups. <laughs> The United Nations that funneled trillions into think tanks and NGOs, and then you add the uh, Soros Foundations and the World Economic Forum, and they kind of they become today's deep state. All of them working together to empower an ideology, an agenda, and design to remake the globe. A new narrative has been created and has been revealed and is now being preached to end American hegemony 
and to end nation states and create a single global authority run by this deep state. A design that I believe is the same exact agenda that mankind attempted back in Genesis at the Tower of Babel. And the agenda back then was that their deep state did not want to remain confined by the boundaries Yahweh established. You can read all about that account in Genesis chapter 11. And those boundaries from the nations were for a righteous purchase purpose, to establish justice, peace, and tranquility to follow Yahweh Elohim's lead. But of course, men are never content with that. The counsels of the wicked are to continually meld and merge what is good for things alien and hostile to the people of God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, 5 through 8 kind of talks about this. It says, his people have acted corruptly toward him. The spot on them is that of his children, but of a perverse and crooked generation. Is this how you repay the Lord, O foolish and senseless, senseless people? Is he not your father and creator? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years long past. Ask your father and he will tell you. Your elders and they will inform you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Men have never been content with that. They don't want the inheritance that God was establishing for them. They want it all as Satan inspires them. They want the whole enchilada, the whole globe. They want everything under a single authority established by men and all people controlled by these councils of men. Nothing new under the sun. This is the same spiritual mindset that existed, I believe, at the building of the Tower of Babel. They defied God. They hated his establishment of both law and national portion and inheritance. They decided that they were the ones to rule the world. They were going to build utopia and influence those in power to make themselves as God. Yeah, Gene, I just saw your mic come up. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I don't know if this is irony or, or something that was made to happen, but uh, like, the, like uh, the Tower of Babel or Babel, uh, more and more, we don't speak the same language here. You know, uh, between uh, conservatives and leftists. Yeah, no, we're exactly. They have a different language. They're they're changing the language, um, as it were. You know, redefining the meaning of words, and that's how uh, they 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 become the de facto narrative uh, establishers. Um, hey, Michael. Yeah. You know, I, as you know, I've I've been a little nervous as of, about talking about politics, but. I think you're doing fine, but uh, w one thing that I found when when we used to travel to D.C. and visit with our congressmen and, and senators uh, was that the next time we went up, you know, we'd, we'd get to know the staff real well, and the next time we went up, you know, that senator or congressman wasn't there anymore, and so we went to see a different one, and it was the same staff. Now, yeah. granted, this is not, I mean, I don't know if this is part of the deep state or not, but this is what I call a bureaucracy. So I'm not yes. sure, what, what, you know, I don't know if you want to get into the difference between deep state and bureaucracy, but it seems to me it's different. Yeah, I think at one time it was, but now you're finding that the bureaucracy itself is deeply tied to the deep state. I guess I would define deep state are the ones that, have the money that are uh, making the policy decisions, at least in the modern, it, what's happening here in the United States and in, in the West. The people behind the scenes that are funneling huge sums of money to get the bureaucrats to impose their agenda. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I just wonder, and there's no way we could find out, but I, I, I wonder how much money these, these staff people are getting from some of the uh, big, big spenders up there. Uh, a bit well, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, consider the, what the actually stated salaries of most of the uh, government employees, including the representatives you send to Congress. How does Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and all of these people on the salaries that are established and have been established are multi-millionaires? Where, 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 where do all those funds come from? If they're public servants, where 
are, are they becoming so, uh, you know, uh, insanely rich? And I think that just, just answers, I think, the point of, you know, money, lobbying groups, uh, gifts, and all kinds of uh, uh, political favors are bought and paid in order to establish uh, these agendas that of the deep state that kind of operates, you know, behind the scenes, whispering in the ears of those that actually can uh, make policy. And again, ultimately, it all comes to, they want to be in charge of everything. You know, they want to surplant heaven with their own lofty tower. And as uh, uh, Gene brought up, you know, only now technology has progressed to the point that it can overcome the language barrier that Yahweh Elohim imposed to slow down where mankind is now arriving. You know, we're we're at the at the place I think that God may have seen that that mankind may have gotten too much earlier had He not uh, 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 confounded the languages. But with technology being what it is now, it doesn't matter anymore. I just read last night at like one o'clock in the morning. There's a new app that China and some other think tank are putting out with the World Economic Forum that makes all language barriers obsolete. Uh, that a single algorithms that actually can get the meaning and thoughts and everything put into a, a single language. And they're going to try to be introducing that soon. So, you know, the technology is progressing to the point that what God established in order to slow down where we're arriving uh, is now is, is kind of gone. And, uh, you hey. know, the, yeah. You know, they already have apps because I use it at work that um, detect language and, and immediately translate. So all I got to do if somebody's talking and I can't understand them, um, I just hit this and it'll detect their language and then it'll translate it as best it can. You know, it's pretty good. And then I can just talk into it and it'll translate it into their language and they can hear me. It's that instant. And there's lots of languages on this app. Boy, Telugu, because I could really use that next time. Telugu is even on there, yes. That'd be great to have next time we go out there and actually talk directly with them out route. Okay. Um, Michael? Yeah. I mean, all the time I read articles in Arabic on oil and gas, and you just go to the article and, you know, it does an automatic, trans, does an automatic translation and... Uh, in Firefox. Oh. Yeah, you, you could do that on YouTube and a lot of things too, yeah. Yeah, but I've done it on YouTube as well, yes. It, it, YouTube isn't as good, I don't think. John, you had a comment? Uh, yes, Michael, going back to the deep state, if I can um, say this in a clear way, uh, in other words, translated out of my mind into English. <laughs> Then I can uh, uh, going back to the deep state. One clear evidence, only one, uh, not not only one, but one of the clear evidence I see of a deep state existing is that many times in the past uh, you'll have some issue, major issue, come up nationwide, and all of a sudden the next day uh, they Congress has got thousands and thousands of pages of rules and everything, uh, bills that they're going to be passing or wanting to try to pass in order to put a law against it. And I can't imagine anybody single-handedly getting all of this together at one time within about 24, 48, uh, 72 hours, like we've seen so many times in the past. So it, it's obvious to me that there these things have been sitting on the shelf just waiting for the right application and movement toward uh, whatever the, the great reset is supposed to represent. Exactly. I mean, case in point, I think the point of, I remember reading the uh, uh, Patriot Act that, that was put in place after 9-11 was actually written during Bill Clinton's term, and it was just sitting in a drawer waiting to be, waiting to be uh, slightly amended for uh, the uh, never let a crisis go to waste is a, is one of the doctrines that they follow in, in, in Washington. And so that was done because it was an amazing, that was tens of thousands of pages. Um, but yeah, you know, one of the things about, you know, that we're learning is that the, these people that we would refer to as the deep state, I mean, they, you know, they're empowering themselves, they're enriching themselves, while at the same time, uh, working to subjugate everyone else to worship basically their perverted woke religion. And these are essentially counselors and wickedness from the house of Jezebel and Ahab 
for to our destruction. And you know, they've 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 infiltrated everything everywhere like yeast. I mean, if if, if you consider uh George Soros backed district attorneys, you know, people funded by George Soros to win elections, they were put into power all across our country, and their job is to sow chaos and political instability, to only prosecute enemies of the state or enemies of wokeness, which is their religion, and to refuse to prosecute those who are their political allies, you know, to openly ignore laws that they disagree with and refuse to prosecute those who are their political uh, allies and apply the law only to those that they hate, to basically create a caste system, an injustice system within the legal foundation of the country. And it's gotten so bad that major cities right now are basically unlivable. Innocents are attacked with impunity, no charges uh, to those that are actually caught perpetrating crimes, uh, and the perpetrators, if they are apprehended, are walking free within hours, you know, with their bail and their legal fees paid for, to the point that now mobs will literally rob, rape, and pillage because these district attorneys have established policy that theft itself, the, you know, thou shalt not steal, is no longer a crime for uh, certain people. You know, so mobs basically flood stores with garbage bags and they clean out shelves and they're casually walking away and they walk away knowing that no one's going to stop them because they're they're uh, shielded from from those things. Meanwhile, if you're a Christian, you know, you could go to prison for holding a church service. You know, if, you know, if they say, oh, no, you can't meet because of a pandemic, you can't meet because of this or that. And. They gleefully, gleefully will, will arrest pastors, but not people that are uh, burning down uh, city blocks and beating people up, raping them and, and stealing places uh, blind. And this is how the deep state in many ways is more powerful than those who are elected to office. They're unaccountable. They influence the decisions uh, that those in office make that affect society as they seek to reshape it into their image and likeness. Uh, I think I was Tucker Carlson. I remember saying that he thought Black Lives Matter was more powerful than anyone in the Senate because of what they, they were able to reshape the entire government policy towards that ideology. And again, that, I think that's another throwback to the Tower of Babel. You know, if, if Soros is not accountable to any U.S. taxpayer. His influence has no arresting power by a righteous or a lawful people any more than uh, Alathalia was accountable to the tribes of Israel. Soros can do as he pleases to reshape society as he wants. Same thing with Klaus Schwab. And those ideologies, those agendas, and those designs promoted by Soros and the World Economic Forum, and most of the left, are what biblical believers in the way recognize as evil, as in biblical evil. You know, the slaughter of infants that are decreed to be a moral virtue and a public imperative. I mean, we know that sacrificing children to Molech was decreed an evil in scripture. But that's not so to our modern day Moloch worshipers of Planned Parenthood. You know, we have lies, adultery, homosexuality, abominations galore. You know, they're grooming our, our young children to become sex objects in public schools. None of these things bring them any shame for they consider wickedness virtuous. They insist by law and by force to teach them to your children. And if you disagree, or if you oppose them, then you are deemed an extremist and a terrorist by the counselors of the president. The deep state is antithetical to God's laws. They supplant God's laws for the desires of men. They criminalize the morality of Yahweh Elohim and impose their own morality by intimidation and then by force. Now this evil is a religion, though today we call it politics only because there's no wooden idols in their hands or statues that they bow down to physically. Instead, they bow down to ideology. But it's a religion, make no mistake about it. They worship themselves and their stations in power as God. They worship the flesh and its desires as God. And in a world that has discarded the spiritual and no longer regards it, politics becomes the de facto religion. Government becomes the cathedral of worship and the deep state are the priests that use their influence to ensure its acceptance and practice throughout the land. In many ways, that's no different than what Jezebel's priests or Alathalia did to influence the kings to shape their society. But like the pagans of old, the false gods and the religion of men 
they're intolerant of the laws of God and those who, who adhere to them. You can see that evidenced in Genesis 19. And I say this all the time, you can ask Erica, everything you need to know about the homosexual trans, transgender agenda or doctrine is found in Genesis 19. They will force themselves upon whomever they desire to force themselves upon, and they will do violence against all who oppose them, and they have legal permission to do so. So in a nutshell, that's kind of how I see the deep state. It's a, and I think it's a corollary to the verse that uh, Skip read in Second Chronicles that tell us counselors and wickedness literally led to Ahaziah's destruction and ultimately the northern kingdom of Israel's demise. Which I guess that leads me, at least it led in my mind, the inevitable question. Is the deep state itself or was the deep state itself responsible for Israel's fate? Can we blame it all on the deep state for where things have gotten? And I think there's a cautionary tale here. We read many, many verses in scripture, scripts read a lot of them, I'm only gonna give you three, that at a glance would appear to lay the blame for the destruction of Israel on the wicked kings. For example, 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, verse two, even though I lifted you out of the dust and made you ruler over my people Israel, you've walked in the way of Jeroboam and have caused my people Israel to sin and to provoke me to anger by their sins. First Kings chapter 22, verse 52. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father and mother and of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to sin. Second Kings chapter 10, verse 31. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. So the question is, are the people then, the plebes, the rabble, the common folk, are they blameless in the establishment of the deep state, a cabal of wickedness and corruption? Are they and we by extension, therefore, absolved from blame for the evil counsels of the wicked uh, of to the rulers? Is the deep state solely responsible for the course of a nation that it collapses itself into? If you look at the previous three verses I just read, you, you could kind of easily conclude that would be the case if one's just, you know, casually looking at it or proof texting, uh, or if they're beholden to the doctrine, and I've read this, of hierarchy, that all responsibility and power flows from the top down, that we're not responsible what our rulers do or our leaders do or our ministers do or our pastors do. We're not, I'm not responsible, they're responsible. But let's look further into it from scripture. And we're gonna find that God indicts the people themselves for where the state of wickedness and lawlessness exists. Second Kings chapter 13, um, verses uh, five through six says, so the Lord gave Israel a deliverer and they escaped the power of the Arameans. Remember Skip read this verses where they were at war with uh, 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 Aram. This is Syria. Uh, the Arameans are Syria. Think Syria yeah. when you read that word. It says, then the people of Israel, all right, that's all, he delivered them from this. And then the people of Israel lived in their own homes as they had before. Nevertheless, they did not turn away from the sins that the house of Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit, but they continued to walk in them. The Asherah pole even remained standing in Samaria. So that tells you right there that the people themselves continued to sin. They continued practicing the wokeness of the time, the idolatry to those cultish ideas contrary to the law of God. And they left the monuments to their wokeness standing. They did not repent. Unchecked lawlessness becomes an institution and soon everyone takes part. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter eight, verses 11 through 13 says this, when the sentence for a crime is not speedily executed, the hearts of men become fully set on doing evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and still lives long, yet I also know that it will not go well with those who fear God, who are reverent in his presence. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. So it's not just the hearts of kings and counselors that become fully set in doing evil, but all men, especially when the state no longer adjudicates justice and the wicked and the criminal go free because they're allies of the ruling class. Michael, it, yeah. 
you know, th this kind of reminds me, of course, this is hundreds of years later, but it reminds me of what Paul was dealing with as he went across Asia Minor. Um, and, and Acts 15 is a good example when they had the council on, you know, whether Gentiles should be circumcised. And, you know, when, when most people read that, they think it was just a question of of circumcision. It was It was a question of circumcision in order to be saved observing the law in order to be saved. You know, uh, we don't question that we should observe the law, but we don't observe the law in order to be saved. But what what Paul and, and Barnabas that first time through, and then and Paul, uh, Silas, and Timothy, as they went across Asia Minor, what they kept running into when they came into a city is how much fun it was to go to the temple. You could have sex at the temple. You could eat food sacrificed to idols. You could eat, you know, drink blood. You could do all kinds of stuff that was fun. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure drinking blood would would be fun, but uh, apparently they thought it was. So, uh, the, what you're reading here, what you've been reading, turned into what Paul was dealing with hundreds of years later. In that, it was so much more fun to not obey God. And, and to and to go do what their neighbors were doing with their neighbors and so on, uh, than than to obey God. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. You know, tyranny. You know, from 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 the the people on high. I mean, you look at I'll give an example. Of, you look. I have, I have relatives that uh, were in in Germany in the 30s and 40s under Hitler, and they loved them. They still do, mainly because uh, things were good for them. You know, tyranny wasn't visited upon them. You know, tyranny was visited upon the ones that the state declared their enemies. You know, the Jews and the, uh, uh, you know, all, all the, the rabble that Hitler wanted to get rid of. Ultimately, that ended up, everything was turned on them as well. But for a time, they, they thought that he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, and that way, tyranny becomes a participatory sport where, hey, if I go along to get along, then it'll go well with me. Yeah, Arthur, you have a comment. Uh, yes, thanks very much. Um, I have a, uh, an email here, and it's about the government, and the title of the bill that they're seeking to pass is called Respect for Marriage Act. Now, notice the terminology, it's very interesting. Respect for Marriage Act. Uh, in, actually, in actual fact, and I'll read this, the bill pushes same-sex marriage nationwide and will allow one state with child marriage laws to set national marriage policy plus expanding the abuse of children it silences people of faith and has no religious exemptions it's urgent he says uh, that if we do not uh, stop this uh, progress if we let them pass this bill forcing people of faith and others to give privileges to same-sex pedophile incestuous and any other type of marriage put up in quotes and uh, it, it said it will uh, create a tremendous um, amount of problems in our nation even greater than ancient israel we have all of this scientific technology that is available now and capitol hill right now is looking at passing these uh, laws, and I've read other articles on this, which does not bar any sexual relationships or age groups of sexual relationships, marriage of children with grandparents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think we're in a time now which is absolutely terrible, horrendous, worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I don't have any disagreement with you. And the thing about legislation, it's always the opposite of what it's named. When like they said it was the. Uh... Uh, the bill that passed the ramp through that Biden's about to sign called the Inflation Reduction Act. Spending trillions of dollars does not reduce inflation, but that's what they're calling it. So it does the opposite. But what interest in what you mentioned, Art, uh, Arthur, is the look at, at, at the trajectory of just the last couple of years, how all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're pushing this child grooming in our public schools. They're teaching children to become sex objects. You know, they're, they're keeping it secret from the parents helping them you know, experiment with being transgender or being homosexual or experimenting, actually having sex in the classrooms. Uh, elementary school kids doing this. 
and their parents get wind of this and throw a hissy fit, the FBI has labeled the parents domestic terrorists. So that shows you the trajectory of where things are going. And now they're just simply codifying it in the law. Uh, and again, I'm just going to say that openly off the top of my head, any anything, any law that the, these people in power pass that contravene God's laws are not laws at all. We are not obligated to obey them. We're actually obligated to defy them, especially if you look at what our founders had to say about them. We'll get into that here in a minute. Um, so in a society that you know celebrates uh, sodomy and celebrates wickedness and criminals go free, um, you know, and so it, 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 what you have then with the leadership imposing this by bills like Arthur, you have a situation where top-down leavening is happening, and that's faster than bottom-up leavening. Uh, we kind of see an example of this in Micah chapter 6 and verse 16. It says, you've kept the statues uh, of Omri, and again, he was an evil king, and all the practices of Ahab's house. You have followed their counsel. Therefore, I will make you a desolation in your inhabitants, an object of contempt. You will bear the scorn of the nation. There is a come up for that. Prophet Micah's nation, the people, that it's they who kept the evil ways of their leaders, Omri and Ahab. They followed the counsel of the deep state, and they should have known better because the law of God was not hidden from them. So the whole nation is going to be judged, not just the house of Omri or the house of Ahab or the house of Jeroboam, because those judgments were already meted out upon those houses by the time of Micah's statement. The judgment of desolation is charged to the people. That's an important fact to consider. Uh, Hosea chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. Uh, again, they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their guilt. He will punish their sins. He says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as first fruits, the fig tree in the first season. But they went to Baal, Peor, and consecrated themselves to shame. So they became as detestable as the thing that they loved. You know, and again, he's speaking of the people of the nation, not just the kings and his counselors. They share equal blame. You know, the deep state, in many regards, is kind of a reflection of the people, same as the ruling class. If a holy people tolerate evil, then it's evil, and the charge will be attributed to them as well. And they share equal blame. If the people were righteous, if they issued evil counsel, they with Yahweh's help, would remove it from the land and even put to the sword those who perpetrate such evil. And of course, as you mentioned this, there's always get the lecture, but violence is not a proper godly response, we're told. And I kind of raised my eyebrows at that thought because uh, we read that Elijah put to death the priests of Jezebel, did he not? 800 of them, if I, if I remember Skip's study correctly, and basically, it wasn't that he was just slaughtering them for slaughter's sake. He was administering justice according to the covenant in Israel. And I guess somewhere along the line, we bought the, the lie in, in churchianity and even in, in, in our culture that we have no obligation to administer justice according to the laws of God or even the Constitution. Those things we've told ourselves are not our responsibility. They're either God's responsibility or we will simply elect people to do it for us even though it's self-evident that the deep state of evil will not suffer any infringement uh, upon themselves. So what happens when the leaders and institutions voted upon by the people abide by the counsel of the wicked and are corrupted? Are the people then absolved from not resisting the wicked? Proverbs chapter 28, verses four and five. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law fully resist them. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord comprehend fully. You know, the fact is true justice is a biblical construct found within the law of God. Man's justice is tyranny and caste and oppression. And our founding fathers, they understood this implicitly, which is why they warned us that our constitution was only for a moral and religious people, because there is no justice with evil men, you can't have it. As Benjamin Franklin noted, as societies become more corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. And basically what he's saying in the language of the day is, 
they need a police state in order just to have order. So when a society praises the wicked, as ours does, there's a duty for those who walk in the way to resist it. Not just to refuse to engage in sin, but to actively resist the implementation of such evil because it's like leavening. At least that's how I view it. And I know that that's how our founding fathers viewed it. Because if we don't, we're gonna be allowing society to become fully leavened with wickedness. It'll be like art is warning where we're going. You know, We're not blameless for what happens therefore as a result. The scripture tells us that when the people return to the sins of Jeroboam, Ahab and Jezebel, the nation itself and the people themselves bear the blame. Second Kings chapter 17, verses 23 and 23 here. It says the Israelites persisted in all the sins that Jeroboam had committed and did not turn away from them. Finally, the Lord removed Israel from his presence as he had declared through all of his servants, the prophets. Again, that's their function. So Israel was exiled from their homeland into Assyria where they are to this day. So the people did not repent. And the servants of Yahweh, the prophets, plural, meaning they had been pleaded with by the people of God, not just one or two, but the people of God in the way to repent. You know, you may recall that I noted the similarities in the duties and the calling of a prophet to that of a Christian today. And again, the first word Yeshua uttered when he began his ministry was what? Class, first words Jesus uttered when he began his ministry. Anyone know? Repent. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Art. Uh, repent, isn't it? For the kingdom of God is at hand. Bingo. Yes. Awesome. That's exactly, that's how his ministry started. Then you go to the time of Pentecost. What did the apostle Peter say to the crowd when they said, what are we supposed to do? Repent. Same thing. Repent and be baptized. Uh, you know, and that's 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 the that's the cause. That's what Christ did. That's what the prophets were trying to get the people to do. But in an age of lawlessness and wickedness, doing that is going to earn you persecution, big time persecution. Yeah, Jim. Uh, you know, the first thing that Jesus said was very political, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. Um, you know, once lawlessness and evil is leavened in the land, once it's preached and protected by a deep state, there is no longer any room for thoughts, behaviors, or beliefs contrary to what wokeness or wickedness demands. Persecution and oppression become institutionalized, and the deep state becomes literal priests to serve the agenda and the narratives that everyone is demanded that they must comply with. Uh, let's see what David has saying. Psalm 94, 20 and 21, he says, can a corrupt throne be your ally? <laughs> one, one devising mischief by decree. They band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. And that's the nature of corruption on high. When the state or the throne is corrupt and devises evil, and demands that it be followed by decree when they make themselves gatekeepers to everything, information, access to uh, uh, commerce, uh, and anyone that doesn't comply is going to be condemned. You know, once you call out the evil, once you demand godly justice upon the counselors of evil, or defy them, or do justice upon those doing evil, whom are the darlings of the deep state, it's you who will be targeted for condemnation arrest, punishment, and even death. That's just the nature of the deep state. I mean, recall, you know, that Elijah ran in fear. That is, he ran away in fear of Jezebel's agents after she swore to kill him after the events at Mark Carmel. We read that in 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 3. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the priests with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, Quote, may the gods deal with me and ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like the lives of those you killed, unquote. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now, I don't know about you, but to me it's baffling in one regard. You know, Elijah's the guy who ridiculed and scoffed the 800 priests of Baal 
all day long at Mount Carmel. You know, he's teasing them. You know, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he took a trip. Maybe he's taking a pee. You know, he's relieving himself. And then he soaked the wood in the altar, uh, you know, repeatedly. And then we, he, he, he prayed and then Jehovah consumed everything with fire, including the stones of the altar in a demonstration of the one true God. And then Elijah slew 800 of those priests, just as the covenant called for. And then, but suddenly now he's afraid, afraid for his life. And I can only imagine the machination of Ahab's deep state. Whatever alphabet agencies that he had at Jezebel's disposal at the time must have been intimidating enough because once Jezebel threatened Elijah directly, he fled in fear. And this is almost a guarantee of what happens to the servants of Yahweh Elohim, who in an attempt to save their people from the consequences they're heaping up for themselves, they become the enemies of the state and targets of the wicked. And Yeshua himself noted this is a near guarantee in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. Michael. Yeah. Vicky, would like for you to go back and put up Ben Franklin's quote for a second. Uh, okay, I got to remember where I'm at here. Hold on a minute. Slide 46. Uh, I got to remember where that quote is. Okay, here we go. Yes. Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom as nations become corrupt and vicious. They have more need of masters. Did you have a comment about that, Vicky? Ma? I just... Um... Well, I couldn't ca catch that word uh, in the third sentence down. Is it vicious? Yes. When they Thank become corrupt and vicious. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Thanks so much. Oh, no, it's not a problem. We 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 are are. It's part of the way we do things here. Being interrupt. It's not an interruption. It's our ability to be able to learn and sharpen iron and and understand things. And that's one of the great things about this interactive format that I I've enjoyed so much. I think we learn more. So that we, well, can stop, we can ask questions, we can make a comment, we can ask for clarification. It's really good. I, I understand that, but you're on a roll and I sort of got you off of it. I'm sorry. No, not at all. I'm going to go right to the scripture here and we're, we're good. Okay. So, uh, okay. It says, uh, here's Jesus again. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I've longed to gather your children together is, Hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Again, they kill the prophets. They persecute the people of God. And again, Second Timothy, this is Apostle Paul warning Timothy. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You read that verse, and it's not, you know, maybe. He basically says they will be persecuted, which coincides with what Jesus said was going to happen to his followers. They will do these things because that is the nature of the deep state of evil. Notice Yeshua says that all who desire to live godly lives, you know, you who wants to be left alone, to live life, worship Yahweh, raise moral children, follow and practice biblical morality, we're going to be persecuted by evil men who are deceived and then go about deceiving everyone else. So in that way, we should not be surprised at what we see taking place around us. This has happened before. The only real difference is that the evil and the wicked did not have the technology back then to make their deceptions and impositions as insidious, intrusive, and as widespread as they are now. It's now so clever in our technological age, most have no clue or any idea of just how corrupted they themselves have become. Just in order to make a living, you have to go along to get along with the deep state. And so the deep state of evil attempts to corrupt everyone and everything. And those who have the ear of kings and politicians have evil delivered from the top on down. But likewise, a leavened mob of people has evil rise from the lowest on up. And it's why John Adams wrote this on October 11th, 1798. He wrote, we have no government armed with power capable 
of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Again, he's speaking of the fact that the people themselves, the government can contend with a mob, you know, and, and the very nature of a deep state, evil comes from, uh, you know, from within, from among the people. And then also from the evil that the people set above themselves, top down, bottom up, inside out. Human nature has not changed a whit in the entire written history of mankind. It's the same thing. For example, hear what the psalmist had to say uh, about this nature uh, and see that, you know, it, it does not, you see if it doesn't fit just like a glove. The deep state seeking to subjugate everyone in the world to its in, uh, insanities of evil. And many people in the world are, will applaud the deep state for doing so. Psalm 73 verses three through five says, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggle in their death. Uh, their bodies are well fed. They are free of the burdens others carry. They are not afflicted like other men. Okay, this is just verse three, I'm sorry. Uh, again, look at that verse. And what it's saying is they don't shop at Kroger. They don't worry about making ends meet. They can tell us with a straight face that there is no inflation because they themselves are rich with our money and they don't share the same burdens that the rest of us do. So they gaslight us. They tell us that inflation is just a figment of our extremist mindset. Let's continue on with what the psalmist says here. It says, therefore, prize their necklace, a garment of violence covers them for their prosperity precedes iniquity. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and speak with malice, with arrogance, they threaten uh, oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut across the earth. So their people return to this place and drink up waters in abundance. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the most high have knowledge? Behold, these are the wicked, always carefree as they increase their wealth. Surely in vain, Oh, I gotta go to the next verse, my apologies. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. In innocence I've washed my hands, for I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. And if I had said, I will speak this way, and what that means is my understanding is, I'm gonna go along to get along. I'll speak wokeness and salute the transgender and BLM in order to keep my job, to keep my station, but then, but then I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, I was troublesome uh, in my sight until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I discerned their end. In Psalm 73, four through, uh, or 13 through 17 there. Then he discerned their end. And it is right there, brethren, that those words, when I was putting this presentation together, that I saw that this message today is not going to end on a dour or depressing note. A comeuppance is in store for the deep state of evil. And when it does fulfill prophecy, it will, it will trod down the saints for a season. But Jehovah makes it clear. We'll look at Isaiah chapter 15, verse 11. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will end the haughtiness of the arrogant and lay low the pride of the ruthless. Amen, yes? Amen. Does somebody have a comment? I'm hearing noise. Somebody have a comment? Rod needs to mute his mic. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So I say amen to that verse. I mean, can we be like David and less like American churchianity and pray for that fulfillment? You know, Christ Jesus is going to end these traits of evil and the nature of the deep state when he comes. And it's a great reason alone to pray for thy kingdom come. You know, we're not ignorant of the lawless evil that's to rise upon the world with the help of wicked counsels of the deep state. Scripture has outlined this for us. The blueprint has been revealed. And like the following section of prophecy I'm gonna read here. Now, whether or not this specific passage I'm gonna read is about to happen soon or a hundred years from now is, I think it's irrelevant. The fact is what I'm about to going to happen, time and circumstance to all men is that we do not have to be trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly. The signs of the times speak. 
if we are awake and we're watching. So I'm going to turn to Daniel chapter 8. We'll start in verse 18 and 19. Daniel says, while he was speaking with me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face on the ground. And then he touched me, helped me to my feet and said, behold, I will make known to you what will happen in a latter time of wrath because it concerns the appointed time of the end. So in my reading here, this time frame uh, for when this vision Daniel saw takes place uh, it, it, at a specific time, rather than a general large swath of time, a la, you know, the end of the age, that some people argue is from the time of Christ's resurrection until now. This passage, however, seems to me to be specific. It is, quote, the appointed time, unquote, of the end. I mean, consider, we observe the appointed times of the Lord. And they happen on specific times and specific dates. So I kind of think this is specific to an exact event that's going to happen at the literal end of the age of the rule of the nations, just before the imminent return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And I'm happy to be corrected if, if anyone has a different understanding as far as chronology goes, or if you see it differently. But uh, that's kind of how I view it. I'm going on in Daniel chapter 8, 23 to 25. It says, in the latter part of their reign, when the rebellion has reached its full measure, kind of what Art was talking about, an insolent ruler, skilled in intrigue, will come to the throne or come to power. And his power will be great, but it will not be his own. You know, other Elohim will probably sure help him out. He will cause terrible destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men along with the holy people. Through his craft and by his hand, he will cause deceit to prosper. And in his own mind, he will make himself great. In a time of peace, he will destroy many. And he will even stand against the prince of princes. We know that to be Yeshua Messiah. Yet, he will be broken off, but not by human hands. And uh, that's, that's, that's very exciting. He's going to be wiped out and destroyed. Now, I've heard that this ruler is the Antichrist or the beast and or the false prophet. Now, whatever he is exactly, the fruits of what he does reads a whole lot like the nature of the deep state to me. Hubris and they're arrogant, insolent, skilled in lying and causing deception. He destroys mighty men and nations and destroys the holy people of God. And, you know, that sounds a lot like the Great Tribulation to me. Could be wrong, but that's what it sounds like to me. And this guy is able to cause deceit and lies to prosper, prosper, you know, to spread everywhere where everyone accepts the lies as truth. You know, for example, men can get pregnant now. Nuclear families are racist and evil. And this guy thinks himself untouchable and the ultimate power in the universe. He can do what he wants without any shame, any fear or concern. And he's so filled with his own self-importance and might. He's literally going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Yeshua Christ, the King of Kings, after he descends back to the earth and splits the Mount of Olives in half. That's pretty arrogant, but Scripture says he's going to do it. This guy, he's going to think he can destroy God, but he's a legend in his own mind. He is going to be destroyed, but as it says, not by the hand of man. God himself, his salvation is going to end him, and amen to that. And then the true master of the deep state, the ultimate counselor of wickedness, who whispers into the ears of both rulers and the least people on earth is dealt with. Look at Revelation here, 20 verses four through six. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss, holding in his hand a great chain. A great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, Michael, you're bound. reading something different from what we're seeing. No, oh, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why that happened. Oh, I guess I must have missed a, a verse there. Okay, well, I must have. Uh, my bad. I, I'm reading uh, the verse before this. My my bad. I made a mistake. Uh, my apology is there. Um, it, it, in that verse of Revelation, I guess it's verses one through uh, three. It's saying that um, it saw an angel coming down from heaven. Uh, and they bound the, the serpent, the devil, the Satan, uh, devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. They threw him into the, uh, the pit, shut it, and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were complete. After that, he must be released for a brief period of time. 
Okay, then we get to this particular scripture. My, my, my apologies, folks. It says, then I saw thrones, and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. In other words, they don't think and act the way the deep state wants them to. And they came to life and reign with Christ a thousand years. And I just say more amen. You know, the deep state inspired by the devil who trampled the saints and destroyed the people of God, even their remnant. Uh, they're going to, these evil people are going to have their works undone. The nation that had listened to the deep state of evil embraced the foreign gods and rejected Yahweh Elohim, who God allowed to be completely destroyed, allowed them to be enslaved and lost for the sins of, and their rejection of his salvation, Christ our King. They're going to be brought back and they're going to be restored to where Yahweh intended them to be. We'll read that here. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, it says, For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob. This is Israel. We've been reading about Israel and the, the two kingdoms, of the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. He's talking about Israel as a whole, because that's Jacob. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The foreigner will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. The nations will escort Israel and bring it to its homeland. On, the, on that day, the Lord gives you rest from your pain and torment and from the hard labor into which you were forced. You will sing the song of contempt against the king of Babylon. Verses uh, four through six. How the oppressor has ceased. How his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. It struck the people in anger with unceasing blows. It subdued the nations in rage with relentless persecution of the deep state. But all the earth is at peace and at rest, and they break out in song. You know, folks, and people have pointed out, well, that's just Babylon. But wait, the earth has not been at rest and at peace yet. So this verse here says to me, this is yet to come. I believe the time frame is after Christ returns, that Israel is going to be brought back to the land and that the earth is going to be at peace and they're going to break out in a song. And the peace is coming, brought by the hand of him who we call our Savior and our King, Most High. Amen. And that's it. I'm done. Any comments, thoughts, corrections? I think you did a good job. I, as I told you, I was a little nervous going into this thing. <laughs> you know me. Uh, I thought I thought you did a great job, Michael. It meant a great deal to me. Thank you, Michael. You guys are welcome. Well, I, I wanted to tie it in. What's good. That's how I kind of see some of the stuff is I always apply scripture to what, to me, the book of, of, of the Lord is a living book. I mean, there's lessons to be learned from history, but I always look at it in a modern context. So because it's, it's an instruction book. You know, I've heard that for years and I kind of like to look at it that way. So I hope this was a blessing to everybody. And I hope it uh, helped um uh, help us kind of get a, a real good foundation, not a foundation, but uh, appreciate what Skip's doing in these studies that he's taking us through in the uh, in the prophets. Well, there's obviously That's nothing new under heaven and earth, is there? No, no, there's certainly nothing new on, on, under 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 the sun, I think is the way the scripture yeah, reads. Yeah, under the sun, sorry. Yeah. I do, I do apologize for that omission of that particular scripture. I didn't realize that I didn't have it in there. I must have accidentally erased it. Well, I've never done that before. No, you've never done that before. <laughs> All righty. Well, I appreciate the ability to serve. Yeah, Gene. Uh, well, I was just going to say, uh, as a uh, fantasy novel nerd, uh, I appreciate the Lord of the Rings reference, especially the uh, the worm tongue and Theoden picture there. Uh, yeah. Makes me think of the uh, our present leadership. Yeah, I thought that was a good analogy. If anyone's seen the, if you've read the books or seen the movie, of Wormtongue pretty much, in a way, is kind of an illustration, I think, from Tolkien of what the deep state is. You know, he had the ear, he spoke poison words and literally uh, poisoned the mind of the leadership in Rohan to the point that I think he, you know, began to be, uh, become decrepit. And uh, it was a form of possession uh, by evil. Yeah, Jim. I was just thinking you need to include a little bit of Dune in this. 
you know, I haven't gotten into the all the religious implications of Doom the way I have the Lord of the Rings, simply because, well, my uh, my youngest daughter, Rianne, really got into the Lord of the Rings. And then when you look at it, you realize that Tolkien was actually writing uh, a, a form of Christian apologetics in a fantasy form, where areas I'm not sure that Frank Herbert was writing a uh, a a an ap apologetics of of Christian the Christian religion. If I remember correctly, I think that uh, he was writing a cautionary tale against religion. If if I understand his purpose of writing Dune and all the books that followed. Yeah. It Dune is too complex to explain. <laughs> I think I never have. Well, I, I never have gotten the whole thing. I mean, you know, understand it when I'm there. But if I have to back off and say, why did he write this thing? Yeah, in a, in a weird sure. way, when you look not at as obvious as Tolkien. You know, it's not as obvious as Tolkien. Again, I think like the thing I got out of Dune, all the books, is that you know, that religion creates a, a false messiah that's going to end up destroying the entire world or the entire, you know, the, the way things are for power to himself. And he's going to screw everything up. It's kind of the, the gist I got out of, out, of, out of what Dune was ultimately all about. At least that's how I took it. It's a great book. I like sci-fi, uh, but it's a little bit more George Lucas oriented in terms of the way he took uh, things and, and used it for his own but Tolkien was actually writing a, a Christian uh, apologetics with the, the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, his his big buddy was uh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah, actually, an interesting story about that, if I remember correctly, I, I think it was Tolkien that converted uh, C.S. Lewis from atheism into Christianity, if I remember correctly. Does anyone know? It, it was the yeah, other, but, the other, but yeah. No, uh, that's correct, but uh, Tolkien was uh, upset that Lewis didn't become Catholic when he did oh. become Christian. <laughs> okay. Well, again, it's just it's, again, the, it's interesting when Lord of the Rings and the movies came out. My my youngest daughter was uh, I forget how old she was when they came out, and we went to go see them. We were in one of the corporate churches, and she was so excited about it. She made mention of it during Sabbath services, and she got a talking to. That that's not the kind of movie that we should be taking, that we should that she should be watching and seeing, and uh, she ended up talking to this person and explaining all the biblical allegories that she got out of it, uh, and then this person went with uh, with her. They came came to our house to see it, uh, the Fellowship of the Ring when it came out on DVD, because he he didn't really necessarily believe what she was saying, and he saw the fact that yeah she picked up on all the uh, biblical allegories that are in it. And this person ended up going with us to the midnight showings of the following two in the uh, subsequent years that came out. Uh, so my, my, my Rihanna was, was uh, preaching the, uh, uh, well, not preaching Lord of the Rings, but she was saying, hey, it's okay. It's if you look at it in the right way. I mean, any entertainment can be, you know, blasphemous or contrary to scripture. But, um, you know, if you, it's always good to look at allegories and analogies and things. We are human. We are flesh. Anyway, uh, that's all I have. Anyone else? You skip. You need me to turn this back over to you. Or are we good with the screen I got up? We're we're good with your screen. We just need a closing prayer. Um, let's see who, who who we got. Oops, I don't even know who who all we've got on. I know Mark's on here. Mark, would you close us out today? I actually think Mark, as he may have left his microphone or left it on but um i know he had to go and pick up the young man that we have working with us he had gone on a rafting trip this morning well i and, would rather uh, you do it anyway jill if you don't mind <laughs> oh <laughs> okay our, our great and heavenly father we are so appreciative of your goodness and your love for us and the fact that you care for each and every one of us we thank you for the opportunity to gather together like this. We feel like we love and know one another, even though many of us have never met. And we're grateful for that bond that we have through the love that you have for us. We ask that you'll guide and direct us during this week. We're so grateful for the your power of healing that you have afforded us and our family this past week. And we pray for the health and strength of others who are still in need. We uh, thank you for Michael's presentation. 
and we ask that you'll give us courage and wisdom as we face whatever the future holds. We know that you hold the future in your hands, and so please free us from fear and and uh, that may debilitate us, knowing that you have a better plan and it uh, everything works, all things work to good. As you say in your scripture, and we're thankful for that. We ask your blessing on us as we go forward this week, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks. Well, good job, Michael. That was awesome. I hope I hope I hope it helps in this uh, this series you've taken us in, which has been probably one of the most enriching um, uh, periods of time that I've spent uh, within the within the body of Christ, learning something in a, in a, in many ways and fashions that I hadn't really gone in depth before like this. So it's very good. I appreciate it. All the work you do, going line by line, pretty much. Well, I've learned tons and tons, and and next week we're we're gonna have another. Uh, of the part that I don't really understand. So uh, I'm sure you all appreciate it when I say, I don't know what he's talking about. But <laughs> anyway, so, okay. All right, folks. Well, good to see you, Michael. Good job again. And uh, we'll see some of you Monday night. We'll see some of you Wednesday night. And we'll see some of you Sabbath. So, all right. See y'all later. Thank you, Captain Michael. Thank you, Michael. Very good. You're welcome. See you guys later. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you, Michael. All right. Thank you, you Michael. Thank you, Michael. Bye, Shalom, everyone.